welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. Today, our semi-regular discussion about foreign affairs. The Prime Minister is heading home from the East Asia Summit. Australia is now signed up to two potential regional trade groupings, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, championed by the United States, and the ASEAN-based Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's been a busy time in the region. US President Barack Obama made the first visit by a sitting US President to Burma. He's recently been re-elected and China's recently conducted a once-in-a-decade leadership transition. Joining me to discuss all these issues, Green Senator Lee Rhiannon and Liberal Senator Arthur Sinodinos. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start first with the Prime Minister's visit to the East Asia Summit. I think we are seeing uh, the East Asia Summit uh, uh, mature into the body that we wanted it to be and which leaders said they wanted it to be. Uh, so a meeting of leaders that can talk about strategic questions, security questions, even if they are difficult questions. Uh, the centrality of ASEAN to this process is clear. Uh, ASEAN working together and then ASEAN plus others creating the East Asia Summit. Uh, we think this is a process that continues to be well and truly worth investing in. Uh, my predecessor, Kevin Rudd, uh, worked hard to ensure that the US and Russia were around the table and we are continuing to invest in this process, not only by me being here, but by being the architect of various practical proposals that help the East Asia Summit have depth. Arthur, is it right to say that the East Asia Summit is becoming the preeminent regional forum, although it, it does still seem to be a long way to go before it becomes the place where regional security tensions can be resolved? Well, it's certainly got a slightly broader remit than APEC in the sense that it's more explicitly also encompassing security and other concerns. Um, but we have this pattern of all these international meetings these days and um, it is useful for leaders to get together because if they come to understandings that it can then maybe um, get rid of log jams in policy at other levels of their governments in, and, and so it can promote greater integration if they're doing the job properly. What worries me about the East Asia Summit uh, this time around is the fact that we have potentially two trade deals on the table and it's, I must admit from my point of view a bit confusing following through exactly how we're going to juggle those two. Um, Craig Emerson seemed to be quite relaxed about that but I think it's going to be harder than he thinks. And, and Lee, your view of the, the worth of the East Asia Summit and, and the, the problems, potential challenges in, in having two separate trade deals in, in the same region on the go. Yes, the, this summit uh, does have value, obviously, when leaders come together. It seems as though this one may have been a bit more restricted because it appears it was dominated by territorial disputes involving China in the um, East China Sea. And so hopefully that's been resolved. But uh, I think it is a reminder when when you consider these trade agreements, how they can play out in a number of these countries when their political infrastructure is often quite weak with regard to democratic practices, respect for human rights, that across this region there's hundreds of thousands of people who have been displaced because of rapid economic development, particularly putting in some of the big railways to assist trade in the region and many of the Australian companies clearly want to move into this region and that's where I think Australian the Australian government has a responsibility to ensure that we get the balance right here and local people aren't disadvantaged. Although, although stronger economies are preferable to, to having weaker economies, aren't they? Yes, but it's a stronger economy that does uh, work for local people. Uh, like that's going back to China. You mentioned that we'll come on to that. But you know, like they have a strong economy, but there's so much disadvantage across our country. It's how it works for the people. A final, a final question on the trade agreements, Arthur. Is, it, is there potential, do you think, in the future for the, the two separate trade agreements to, to eventually be rolled into one and create a, a trade area that is, that is much larger and much stronger than, than say, the EU? Um, the potential is always there, but like all these things, I think there's some hard yards to come. And particularly you know, from our own experience trying to negotiate a free trade agreement with China over five or six or how many years it is now, these are not going to be easy processes. There are also some issues with the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the United States is championing. Uh, there are some areas where Australia, I don't think, is prepared to necessarily play ball. So I think there's a long way to go. Just to Lee's point about these trade agreements in, in general, they can be very useful levers for actually opening economies up and giving you a capacity to influence countries by engaging them in the international system. So um, 
Uh, and that does mean that you, in the case of Burner, you do have some leverage, I think, to encourage them along the reform path. So, yeah, there's a yin and yang in all of this. And, and uh, mentioning Burma, Barack Obama made a visit there just before he went to the East Asia Summit. Lee, was it the right time to make such a visit? It certainly appears that it was, and there is a lot of welcome news coming out of Burma. I think uh, some of Aung San Suu Kyi's own comments, so it's wise to remember at this stage where she has said that as you get closer to achieving greater democracy, it's where one can meet some of the greatest challenges. And hopefully our government and the US will also be encouraging ch constitutional change because we have this highly undemocratic current system where the military are guaranteed a quarter of the seats. They continue to dominate the parliament there. Uh, all political prisoners still haven't been released. So while there's been some good moves, we don't have child soldiers, I understand. The labour laws have been uh, improved, media restrictions lifted. Uh, clearly, there's a lot to be done. Arthur, does, does making a visit at a time like this, uh, in fact, give, uh, give someone like Barack Obama, give the US a bit more leverage? Because you show a bit of goodwill by going there, but then then that means you can you can have a bit more of a say, push a bit more for for Burma to to make more of a transition, well, a faster well, transition it, to it, democracy. It's, it's carrot and stick. You provide some carrot in the sense that this is a reward to recognise what you've done to date. You then make it clear that further progress has to be made, and if there's further progress there's further carrots. And the carrots here are not just economic carrots, clearly they are also around the political character of the country, the freedoms and, and whatever. Um, Burma has great potential, there is no doubt about it. So this process is ongoing now, we have to do everything we can to keep it on track and everything that we can do and Barack Obama can do to engage that current uh, military uh, junta which is sort of transmogrifying into uh, a civilian sort of uh, government, uh, we must do everything we can. But Lee is right, as you get towards the end of the process, that's when the rubber hits the road and you can get some of the biggest obstacles to full democracy. But that's exactly the time when you can also apply your leverage and that's why Obama has gone there. Uh, he's, as I mentioned, he was at the East Asia Summit. He's, he's uh, uh, this after his much vaunted pivot towards Asia. Uh, Arthur, do you think he's getting the, the messages right in, in concentrating more on Asia in the sorts of things he's been saying about China? Look, I think he's right to pivot towards Asia, as you say. From our point of view, we do want the US engaged in, in, in the region. Um, as to whether he's getting the messages right, I think what's important there with the Chinese is, is that it mustn't be a sort of confrontational message. Um, it's got to be a message of we want them as fully engaged and owning as much of the international system as, as they can in order that they... Uh, because if they feel part of the process, then they're less likely to want to upset the process or the, the sort of evolving international order. And we've got to make sure to the maximum extent possible that it is a rules-based order, right, that we set down some rules everybody can, can follow. It's in everybody's interest because as China gets bigger, we've got to have a way of making sure that they um, have an interest in the international system as it exists now. But what's critical here is how the US engages with the region. I think it's worth remembering that recently we've heard from two former Prime Ministers, Paul Keating and Malcolm Fraser, being highly critical of Australia's relationship with the US. And within this context... Although there weren't, there weren't criticisms that, that Paul Keating made when he was was Prime Minister. No, they're not, but they're, it's, it's interesting what uh, former Prime Ministers often say, but we do need to look at those criticisms in the context of a US military build-up, not just in Australia, but within the region. Many of those countries who were at the ASEAN summit are now are facing more troop, US troops in their country, something that we haven't seen for a long time. But, that, but the troops are there with the country's acceptance. Yes, the, that's the US true. isn't forcing them well, to that's, take Well, that's troops. true, but um, whose acceptance? Uh, sometimes these governments are not democratic democratic, there is a lot of local opposition and when you consider the Chinese build-up there is a potential for considerable instability here. Uh, Arthur, do you think, do you think the, the potential flashpoints, if there are any in the region, will be the unresolved tensions in the South China Sea and the tensions between China and Japan uh, north of that? Um, there's a few tensions to choose from uh, and what 
we would be encouraging is that uh, there's some more peaceful way of resolving all of these, which is why talking about a more rules-based order, um, this code of conduct people are talking about, let's see what that means in terms of how some of these disputes are settled. But uh, Lee's point about the US in the region, what we are encouraging, I hope, is the US to be a, an active and friendly player in the region. And by saying that we're part of the, the US military alliance, we're not saying anything that's different to what we've done for the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, it's not aimed particularly at the Chinese because uh, we think the US should have a stake in the region because it's also a Pacific power. So, but the message that should go out to the Chinese is that we are all serious about maintaining a rules-based order. Now, there was a once-in-a-decade change in the Chinese leadership. It's thought to be a, a relatively conservative grouping. Uh, there's no sign they want to wind back the economic reforms, but it's still away from political reform, do you think, Lee? Oh, absolutely. It was interesting to see some of the comments of the new general secretary where he identified that they have to tackle corruption and they need to reconnect with people. But uh, there's a big question mark over how, how could that be achieved if you're not moving to greater democracy, greater respect for human rights. And it is interesting to look at how Western countries have interacted with China since the end of the Cold War, whereas now, and this was even coming from Mr Romney during the presidential election campaign, where he even was giving the emphasis on trade relations and not addressing these very important issues, that here is a totalitarian government. Surely Western countries should be calling for greater democracy and respect for human rights. Now, they're comments you don't hear very much from the likes of our leaders. Uh, Arthur, is the path to potentially a democratic China in the end going to be through more and more economic reform opening up to the world as China has it done? The, the engagement with the world is important but ultimately it will come from within China itself and, and this is the dilemma that everybody has. Um, uh, do we wake up one day and suddenly find that the place is a powder keg because uh, there are large groups of the society who feel, whether it's disenfranchised for political or other reasons, who just decide to take it into their own hands? Now, it's such an authoritarian country that you wouldn't necessarily expect that scenario. Some people posit a scenario like the Soviet Union where they basically change into um, a, a form of authoritarian capitalism. Um, but I would hope that what would happen ultimately is that because it's such a decentralised country that all those governing institutions at the local level start to assert themselves more and more and, and just the system just loosens up and you get more and more grassroots democracy and that feeds through the system as a whole. Um, it's very important that um, China gets this right and we help them to get this right. That's why the international engagement is important. But they understand strong messages and they respect that. Finally, on a question much closer to home, the Immigration Minister Chris Bowen announced a raft of changes to to uh, what has been happening and including the first transfer of asylum seekers to Manus Island. Uh, Arthur, do you think th there is a time now to reconsider looking at Malaysia, the, the coalition's opposition to Malaysia? Look, I think what the government should have done is adopted the full suite of the Howard measures and then if they had not succeeded with those measures, they'd be in a stronger position to say, let's go further. Uh, I think they should do that. I, I think ultimately this thing will not be solved until there is a change of government because I think there is a view within the region that the current government is still divided over this whole policy approach and their heart is not really in it. You need to show some strength on this to the region and uh, I think you will get the right response then. And Lee, we're just about to run out of time. Uh, you would want a continuation of onshore processing only? Oh, absolutely. It's a shameful period in our history. Manus Island and Nauru shouldn't be used like this. And that's where we'll have to end it. Thank, thank you very you. much for your time today. Thanks. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Please be with us at the same time tomorrow.